Lecture number seven, The Noble Eightfold Path. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Dukkha, its origin, its cessation, and the way to its cessation. These are the four noble truths. The elephant's footprint that contains within itself all the other teachings of the Buddha. It might be risky to say that any one truth is more important than the others, since they all hang together in a very close, integral unity. But if we were to single out one truth as the key to the whole Dhamma, would be the fourth noble truth, the truth of the way. The way to the end of Dukkha is the noble eightfold path the path made up of right views, right intentions, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. When we say that the path is the most important element in the teaching, this is because the path is the thing that makes the Dhamma available as a living experience. Without the path, the Dhamma would just be a shell, a collection of doctrines and formulas without inner life, without the immediacy of lived experience. The path is the means to self-transformation, the means to spiritual growth and to the attainment of liberation. Without the path, even full deliverance from suffering would just become an empty dream. Now, it should be understood that the Noble Eightfold Path was not created by the Buddha. The path is not a creation or a product of the Buddha's mind. Rather, the path was discovered by the Buddha. Whether a Buddha arises or not, the path remains as the indispensable means to enlightenment. During periods when no Buddha has appeared in the world, then the path might be shrouded in darkness, will be lost to the masses of mankind, completely forgotten. But when a Buddha arises, he does not create the path anew out of his own mind. Rather, he rediscovers the lost path to deliverance and then makes that path known again to the world. In fact, that is the special and unique function of the Buddha, is to rediscover the path during a period of spiritual darkness and then to proclaim the path to humanity at large, to make the path available to the world. And the Buddha says, with respect to the path, he says that on the night of his enlightenment, he uses the phrase, light arose, knowledge arose, vision arose. These statements all indicate that he saw what was already present, but present unseen. He tore away the veil of darkness, the veil of delusion and ignorance, and saw the lost, buried path to enlightenment. He followed that path through to its goal, reached the goal, and then taught the path to the world at large. From one angle, the discovery of the Noble Eightfold Path might be called the primary significance of the Buddha's enlightenment. Before his renunciation, when he was still living in the palace as a bodhisattva, as a prince, he had already recognized the unsatisfactory nature of existence. He had been thrust up against the hard facts of old age, sickness, and death, and he had lost all of his worldly complacency, his desire for power, fame, and for sense pleasures. Then, even from the start, he had an intuition, a confidence that there was a way out of suffering, a state of liberation beyond the round of birth and death. Because of his confidence, he was able to leave the palace to renounce the world in order to go in search of deliverance. But what he did not know, what he lacked, what he had to find, was the path that led to deliverance. And with the discovery of the path, he was able to escape from the trap of ignorance 
to reach enlightenment, to become Buddha. The discovery of the path made it possible for him to attain his own liberation, to attain Ibana himself. And it was also the discovery of the path that enabled him to guide others to liberation, to present others with the gift of the deathless. Therefore, the path gives the Buddha's enlightenment a meaning that goes beyond his own liberation. It makes the Buddha into a world teacher, and it makes his doctrine, his dharma, something relevant to all men, to all beings who seek release from suffering. The path is essentially a way to awakening, a means to generate in our own minds the same experience of enlightenment that the Buddha himself went through while sitting beneath the Bodhi tree. In the causal chain that originates Dukkha, the Buddha points out that all the suffering and unsatisfactoriness we meet in the round of becoming arises because of our craving and our clinging. This craving and clinging in turn is nurtured by the more basic factor, that is, ignorance, the beginningless blindness to the real nature of things that has been covering over our minds. And as long as we remain in ignorance, we go on revolving in the cycle of existence, going from life to life, meeting the various forms of dukkha. In order to get free from dukkha, to get free from suffering, What is necessary is to eliminate the most fundamental root of all bondage, that is, ignorance. To eliminate ignorance, what is needed is its exact opposite, knowledge, the knowledge of enlightenment, the superior wisdom that shines brightly and eclipses the darkness of ignorance. But this wisdom this knowledge of the true nature of things does not arise out of nothing. It arises out of conditions. The set of conditions that lead to enlightenment, these constitute a path, the Noble Eightfold Path. And the Noble Eightfold Path brings liberation by giving rise to the liberating wisdom In describing the Buddha, the the path, the Buddha says that the path produces knowledge, produces vision. Chakku karani, jnana karani. These two terms together, knowledge and vision, the coupling indicates that the kind of knowledge to which the path leads is not abstract conceptual knowledge, but immediate insight. The Buddha says that the path is chakku karani. It produces the eye. It gives us the eye of insight by which we are able to see directly with immediate perception the true nature of things. Then by producing this knowledge and vision, the path leads to peace, upasamaya the peace that comes with the destruction of all craving, all attachment, and all clinging. The path leads to enlightenment, the full and complete realization of truth, sambodhi. And by leading to enlightenment, it leads us out of the cycle of suffering, the round of birth and death, to the ultimate goal, the unconditioned state, nibbana, In his first discourse, the Buddha calls the Noble Eightfold Path the Middle Way, Majjhima Padipadda. He calls it the Middle Way because the Eightfold Path avoids all extremes in conduct and in views. In the first discourse, the Buddha points out that there are two extremes which a seeker of enlightenment has to steer clear of. These two extremes are, on the one side, indulgence and desire, on the other, self-mortification. 
Now, some people hold the view that this life, this present life, is our only existence, that death spells the end to all experience, and therefore we should try to get as much pleasure as we can by indulging our desires. This view, they say, is the superior wisdom and the practice of sensual indulgence and grasping comfort and luxury they hold to be the way to the greatest happiness. But the Buddha, from his own experience, calls this way a low, inferior, ignoble course which doesn't lead to the realization of the highest goal, the true aim of human life. The other extreme is not so common as the first, but it's always had a certain attraction for religious seekers. This is the extreme of self-mortification. Those who follow this practice hold that the way to liberation, the way to enlightenment, lies through strict and austere asceticism, especially through the practice of the mortification of the flesh. Generally, those who follow this path regard the body and the spirit as exclusive and antagonistic opposites. And they see the mind of man as a battlefield where a struggle takes place between the spirit and the flesh. The flesh they hold to be the source of evil, of desire and darkness. The spirit, the source of goodness, of life and freedom. And to liberate the spirit, they say, the flesh has to be subdued by fierce austerities, by tormenting the body, by depriving the body of its vital requisites until the spirit can be released from the prison of the body. The Buddha himself had practiced this path of asceticism before his enlightenment, but he found that it doesn't lead to the goal. Therefore, he later called the path of self-affliction painful, ignoble, and not conducive to the goal. He advised his disciples also to steer clear of it, not to follow that kind of practice. Instead, in its place, he holds up the noble eightfold path as the middle way. And it's called the middle way not because it lies in between the two extremes, as a compromise between too much and too little, but rather because it rises above them, because it's free from their errors, from their imperfections, and from the blind alleys to which they lead. On one side, the Noble Eightfold Path avoids the extreme of sensual indulgence. On the other, it avoids the extreme of self-affliction. To follow the middle path means to provide the body what it needs to stay in a strong and healthy condition, and yet at the same time to rise above bodily concern in order to train the mind in right conduct, concentration, and wisdom. In fact, the middle way is essentially a way of mind training, and one error frequent error has to be pointed out, and that is that the middle way is in no way a compromise with the attitude of renunciation. In following the Noble Eightfold Path, the mind has to be strengthened, trained in the strongest attitude of renunciation, detachment from the demands of craving and clinging. The middle way doesn't compromise at all the spirit of renunciation. But what it recognizes is that the real renunciation, the most important renunciation, is an inward mental act to be achieved by training the mind, not by tormenting the body. Now, as its name suggests, the Noble Eightfold Path is made up of eight factors. And when it's called the Eightfold Path, we have to be careful not to understand this wrongly. The eight factors of the path are not eight steps to be followed in sequence. In actual practice, certain factors have to be developed before other factors can arise. But ideally, each factor that emerges does not replace the one that comes before it. 
nor do the earlier factors that have been developed drop away when the more advanced factors appear. Rather, the early factors remain, but the new ones that arise merge into them and absorb them, so that at its highest level of development, the path consists of eight factors working simultaneously. At this level, all eight factors are present, all are performing their functions, all are contributing in their own unique way to the accomplishment of the goal, to reaching the end of suffering. Now, the eight factors of the path can be divided into two parts. One part is concerned with knowledge, with understanding. The other is concerned with practice or conduct. Now, the first part, the side concerned with understanding contains only one factor, right view. The other part, the part concerned with practice, contains the other seven factors, from right intentions to right concentration. And so from this twofold division, we can see the tremendous weight that falls on right view. Right view is placed first right at the beginning of the path because right view is the eye, the eye which guides and directs all the other factors. And the relationship between the two groups of path factors can be illustrated by an analogy. If we're going to drive a car, we need both our eyes and our limbs. We need eyes to see which way to go and we need our limbs, the hands and feet in order to maneuver the car. If we have eyes, but if we're crippled and can't use our hands and feet, then we can't move the car at all. We'll just remain in the same spot. And if we can use our limbs, but if we lack sight, if we're blind, then it would be dangerous even to try to drive. To maneuver the car and get to our destination, we need both the eyes and the limbs working in harmony. Similarly, in the practice of the path, we need both aspects. The aspect of vision or understanding supplied by right view in order to see the way to travel along the path. Then we need the other factors, conduct or practice, in order to bring us to our destination. Now, the Buddha places right view at the beginning of the path to show that before we can set foot on the actual practice, we need the understanding provided by right view as our guide, our inner director, to show us where we're starting from, where we're heading, and what are the successive stages to be passed through in practice. Usually, the Buddha defines right view as the understanding of the Four Noble Truths suffering, its origin, its cessation, and the way to its cessation. To follow the path right from the start, we need a correct perspective on the human condition. We have to see that our lives are not fully satisfactory, that life is impermanent, that it's subject to suffering. And we have to understand that suffering, dukkha, is something that we have to penetrate through with penetrate through to by means of knowledge, something that we have to conquer, not something that we should escape from by pain removers, entertainments, distractions, or dull forgetfulness. At the deepest level, we have to see that all the things that make up our being, the five aggregates, are impermanent, constantly changing, and therefore can't be held to as a basis for security or unchanging happiness. Then we have to see that the cause of our dukkha lies in our own mind. Nobody is imposing it on us. We can't put the blame outside ourselves. It's through our own craving and clinging, our desires, our dislikes, and our delusions, that we produce suffering and pain for ourselves. Then, when we see that the cause of dukkha lies in our minds, we also understand that the 
key to liberation also lies in the mind. By overcoming ignorance and craving by means of wisdom. Then, to enter the path, we need the confidence that by following the Noble Eightfold Path, we can reach the goal, the cessation of suffering. The Buddha defines right view as the understanding of the Four Noble Truths for a very important reason. The reason is that he does not want his disciples to practice his teaching merely out of feelings of devotion towards him or out of respect for his wisdom. Rather, he wants them to follow the path on the basis of their own understanding, their own insight into the nature of human life. Therefore, the first factor sets out the points to be grasped, the points to be seen as a basis for practice. Then, when we've grasped these essential truths and verified them through thought and reflection, then we're ready to set foot on the path a clear idea of the real aim and groundwork to the practice. Otherwise, to try to practice the path without having this right view is somewhat like just getting into a car and driving in any direction without having a clear idea of where we want to get to and what is the best way to get there. As we will see later, the path begins only with a very elementary level of right understanding. As the mind develops in the course of practice, the understanding will deepen, it will gradually expand and widen. And as it does so, we come back again and again to right view. Right view is not something that we just go through only once and then leave it aside. But again and again, we always come back to right view. But when we come back, we come back at deeper and deeper levels of understanding. Through practice, the consciousness, the mind, is developed. Its range and capacity for comprehension expands, grows, and matures. Then as it matures, the ability to see, to penetrate and understand develops. And when we understand, then we arrive at a deeper level of right view. The second factor of the path is right intention, sama sankapa. The word sankapa means purpose, intention, resolve, aspiration, motivation. And this factor of right intention follows as the natural consequence of right view. When, through right view, we gain an understanding of the real nature of existence, then that understanding acts upon our mind. It changes our motivation, our purposes in life, our intentions and inclinations. Then, as a result, our minds become shaped by right intentions, intentions that accord with right view and that follow from right view. In the analysis of this factor, the Buddha explains that there are three kinds of right intentions. The intention of renunciation, the intention of non-aversion or loving-kindness, and the intention of non-injury or compassion. And these are opposed respectively to the three wrong intentions. The intention of sensuality, the intention of aversion, and the intention of harmfulness or cruelty. Now, right intention, as we said, follows naturally from right view. When we gain a right view into the fact of dukkha, then we become motivated to renounce our attachments, our clinging to pleasure, wealth, power, and fame. These we usually imagine to be desirable, but we take them to be desirable only because we haven't seen their inherent unsatisfactoriness. When we see that they lead to dukkha, that they lead us into suffering and dissatisfaction, then our mind inclines to renounce them, to give them up. We don't have to force ourselves away from, their, from the desire for them. But as we gain the, the understanding, the right view, the desire falls off naturally by itself. 
then when we look at other beings through the lens of the Four Noble Truths, we see that others are also caught up in the net of suffering. And out of this perception, there arises a feeling of deep identification of, with others, feeling of oneness with them, which leads to attitudes of loving kindness and compassion. And as these attitudes arise, they motivate us to renounce, to give up all aversion and hatred and all violence and cruelty. In this way, the three types of right intention follow from right view. Now, the first two factors of the path, right view and right intentions, work together in opposition to the three unwholesome roots. In earlier talks, we explained that the three unwholesome roots are greed, hatred, and delusion. Of these, the most fundamental is delusion. Out of delusion, there arise greed and hatred, the one desiring, the other disliking the wrongly conceived object. Now, right view serves to counteract delusion. Delusion is non-understanding, non-comprehension. And right view gives us correct understanding. It leads to true comprehension. Then the second factor, right intention, counteracts greed and hatred. The intention of renunciation opposes greed. The other two intentions of non-aversion and non-injury counteract hatred. Thus, already at the very beginning of the path, the process is set in motion that will eventually cut off all three unwholesome roots. With the next three factors, we learn to translate right intentions into right conduct. We apply the right intentions to our bodily and verbal deeds, to our general way of life. Thus we get the three factors of right speech, right action, and right livelihood. Right speech has four aspects. Abstaining from false speech, that is, from lying. Instead, making an effort always to speak truthfully. Second, abstaining from slanderous speech, from statements intended to divide others, to create enmity between other people. Instead, the follower of the path should always speak words that promote friendship and harmony between people. Then thirdly, he should abstain from harsh speech, from speech which is angry and bitter, which cuts into the hearts of others. Instead, his speech should always be gentle, soft, and affectionate. And then fourthly, he abstains from idle chatter, from gossip. Instead, he should always speak words that are meaningful, significant, and purposeful. The fact that four factors are mentioned under right speech shows the tremendous power locked up in the faculty of speech. The tongue might be a very small organ compared to the rest of the body, but this little organ can create immense harm or immense good, depending on how it's used. Therefore, in order to gain mastery over our life, we have to master that little organ, the tongue to see that it's used only for good purposes, not for bad ones. Of course, what we really have to master is not the tongue, but the mind that makes use of the tongue. Now, right action, the fourth factor of the path, is concerned with bodily action, with the body as an instrument of action. And this has three aspects. Abstaining from the destruction of life, that is, from killing other living beings. And this applies not only to human beings, but to animals as well, to abstain from hunting, fishing, and needless killing of animals. 
and second, to abstain from taking what is not given, that is, from stealing, cheating, exploiting others, gaining wealth in dishonest or illegal ways. And thirdly, to abstain from sexual misconduct, that is, from illicit types of sexual relations, such as adultery, seduction, rape, and so on. Generally, the lay follower of the path is advised to avoid adultery or any type of forced sexual relation, while those who become ordained into the Sangha as monks and nuns have to observe the precept of celibacy. And it's very frequent also in the Buddhist tradition for lay practitioners who are undergoing a period of in of intensive training and meditation to take temporarily the precept of celibacy. Now, the principles of right speech and right action are worded negatively as abstaining from this and that, but a little reflection would show that positive psychological factors of great power go along with these abstinences. The abstinences are required as the minimal observance, and it is that which comes directly under the control of the faculties of speech and bodily action. But while these outward principles of abstinence are being observed, at the same time, wholesome attitudes of mind are also being cultivated. And that is how the observance of the principles of abstinence brings about a gradual purification of the mind. And the observance of each one of these precepts implies a commitment to some positive mental quality, to a virtue, a habit of the practical intellect. That is, abstaining from taking of life, for example, implies a commitment to compassion, to respecting the right of other beings, life. The precept of abstaining from stealing, taking what is not given, involves a commitment to honesty, to being honest in one's relations with others, and also a commitment to respect the right of others to the possession of their own belongings. The principle of abstaining from false speech implies a commitment to truth to maintain the truth, no matter how difficult it might be to ourselves. And so on, for each one of these negatively worded abstinences, if we reflect, we can find a positive virtue in the mind that has to be cultivated simultaneously. Now, the fifth factor of the path is right livelihood. The Buddha teaches that the disciple should avoid any occupation or job that causes harm and suffering to other living beings, or any kind of work that leads to one's own inner deterioration. Instead, the disciple should earn his or her living in an honest, harmless, and peaceful way. And to give a more specific idea of what right livelihood involves, the Buddha mentions five occupations that a disciple should avoid. These are first, dealing in flesh, in meat, as a butcher. Second, dealing in poison. Third, dealing in weapons or arms. Fourth, dealing in slave trade and prostitution. And fifth, dealing in intoxicants, in liquors and drugs. And the Buddha also says that his followers should avoid deceitfulness, hypocrisy, high pressure salesmanship, usury, and trickery, or any kind of dishonest method in acquiring their means of support. Now, these three factors that we've just discussed, right speech, right action, and right livelihood, these deal with the outer conduct of life. When we come to the next three factors, the sixth, seventh, and eighth factors, then we're concerned with the inner work, with the training of the mind. The Buddha begins the mind training with right effort, samavayama. This factor the Buddha places a special stress on for the reason that the practice of the path requires work. 
it calls for energy and exertion. The Buddha is not a savior. The means to deliverance he gives in the path. And we can't expect to get anywhere along the path without making the effort. The Buddha says that the Tathagatas, the enlightened ones, point out the path. You yourselves must make the effort. The goal, the Buddha says, is for the energetic person, not for the lazy one. And here we come to the great optimism of Buddhism, the optimism which, in my view, refutes all the charges of pessimism. The Buddha says that through right effort, through right exertion, through the right application of energy, it's possible to change and transform the whole structure of our lives. We're not the hopeless victim of our past conditioning. We're not the victim of our genes, of environment, of our upbringing, and so on. But through chaining, through training, through practice and exercise, it's possible to raise the mind up to entirely new levels, to lift it up from the swamp of ignorance and self-centered desire, to bring it to the high plateaus of wisdom, enlightenment, and liberation. It all takes work. All it takes is exercise and effort. Practice that has to be built up day by day, month by month, year by year, even lifetime by lifetime. But with this practice, we can lift the mind up to the highest levels of spiritual attainment. And therefore, the Buddha urges his disciples to strive on with the firm determination. Whatever has not been attained, that I will attain. What hasn't been achieved, that I will achieve. What hasn't been realized, that I will realize. Then, having stirred up the will, we have to know the right way to apply our efforts. Now, the Buddha indicates that right effort can be broken down into four aspects. Firstly, if we observe the states that arise in the mind, we see that they fall into two basic types, unwholesome states and wholesome states. The unwholesome states are the states of mind rooted in the defilement in greed, hatred, delusion, and in their offshoots. The wholesome side consists of the virtuous qualities, the qualities that should be developed and cultivated, like the eight factors of the noble path, the four foundations of mindfulness, the seven factors of enlightenment, and so on. These are the pure, noble qualities that lead to spiritual progress and to ultimate liberation. Thus we have at the opposite sides of the mind the unwholesome states and the wholesome ones. And with regard to each of these, there are two tasks we have to perform. First, with regard to the unwholesome side, we have to make the effort to prevent the unarisen, unwholesome states from arising. The unwholesome states are not always present in the mind. At times, the mind is clear, calm, and pure. Then something happens which sparks off one of the defilements. Now, in developing right effort, in the first place, we have to make the effort to prevent the unarisen defilements from arising. This is the first aspect of right effort, called the effort to prevent. And this is accomplished primarily by control over the senses. If we lack control over the senses, then the mind responds automatically to the sense objects that it meets. It gives way to attachment to pleasant objects. It gives way to aversion and anger towards unpleasant ones. But by maintaining watchfulness over the senses, by watching our reaction to the sense objects, then we can prevent the unarisen defilements from arising. 
were able to simply register the object, to take note of its features without being drawn to react to the object by way of greed and aversion. The second aspect of right effort is the effort to abandon the arisen unwholesome state, that is, to eliminate the defilements that have arisen. When we see in our mind that one of these unwholesome states is present, we have to apply our energy to eliminate it. This can be done by a variety of methods. In one sutta, the Buddha gives five different methods for training the mind to overcome unwholesome states. One method is to replace the unwholesome thought formation by its opposite, by the wholesome thought exactly opposed to it. For example, if strong attachment arises in the mind to, say, wealth or possessions, then we can reflect on the impermanence of those possessions. When we do that, the attachment fades away. If strong sensual desire arises in the mind, especially for a monk or a nun or a meditating yogi, then if he reflects on the impure nature of the body, how the body is just a heap of skin, bones, organs, and blood, then the sense desire fades away. When anger and ill will towards a person arise in the mind, then by reflecting or meditating on loving kindness, the feeling of loving kindness will dispel the anger. Or if the state of depression, dejection arises in the mind, then reflecting on the noble qualities of the Buddha gives a kind of joy and encouragement which inspires us to make further effort. So in that way, we use one thought, a wholesome thought, to knock out the unwholesome thought. In the same way that, for example, a carpenter might use a clean new peg to knock out an old rotten peg from a board of wood. A second method to use is to develop a keen sense of the danger in the unwholesome thoughts, to recognize how they keep us entangled in suffering and prevent us from accomplishing the real good for ourselves and for others. Still, another method is to turn the mind away from the objects that are stimulating the unwholesome thoughts, to divert the mind to some other object of concentration. For example, perhaps just to the breathing or to some move, to the movement of some part of the body. A fourth method is simply to observe the thoughts themselves, to turn the attention upon the thoughts, to see how they arise, then gradually to still them, to make them quiet down. This can be done also by tracing the causes of the thought in sequence, seeing that thought arises from this cause, that cause from this cause, and so on, back in sequence. This makes the disturbing thoughts quiet down. Then, when all of these other techniques fail, and only then, the last measure which can be used is to meet the unwholesome thought in face-to-face combat, to struggle with it and to expel it from the mind. But this should be used only as the last measure. Okay, now we come to the other side, the third and fourth aspects of right effort. On the other side of the mind, we find that there are many pure, wholesome, virtuous states of mind. And for these two, there are two tasks to be performed. First, we have to make the effort to develop the undeveloped wholesome state. We have many beautiful potentials stored up in the mind. We have to bring these up to the surface of the mind, to develop them, strengthen them, to make them shine forth. Then, when we've cultivated them, then we come to the Spell it from the mind. But this should be used only as the last measure. Okay, now we come to the other side, the third and fourth aspects of right effort. On the other side of the mind, we find that there are many pure, wholesome, virtuous states of mind. And for these two, there are two tasks to be performed. First, we have to make the effort 
to develop the undeveloped wholesome state. We have many beautiful potentials stored up in the mind. We have to bring these up to the surface of the mind, to develop them, strengthen them, to make them shine forth. Then, when we've cultivated them, then we come to the fourth aspect of right effort. We have to avoid falling into complacency, but we have to make further sustained effort to maintain the wholesome states that have been developed. We have to stabilize them, then bring them to full growth and completion. Thus, the two aspects of right effort on the wholesome side are first to develop the undeveloped wholesome states, and then second to maintain, increase, and complete the wholesome states that have been developed. By applying these four aspects of right effort step by step, we can cleanse the mind of its defilement until it becomes bright and pure and radiant. Now, it might seem that right intentions and right effort are very similar. And though they are very similar in some respects, they're not exactly the same. Right intentions, the second factor of the path, means the basic purpose or direction of the mind. And right effort, the sixth factor, is the actual application of energy to eliminate the unwholesome state and to develop and perfect the wholesome state. In the actual practice of the path, these factors are so closely intertwined that we can draw a sharp dividing line between them. They actually function together, but what we can do is to distinguish their distinct functions. Right intention is the factor which directs the mind. Right effort is the energy or mental power which energizes the mind. We might compare the two to the steering wheel and the carburetor of the car. The steering wheel determines the direction of movement. The carburetor burns the fuel to supply the energy. And both contribute to the actual movement of the car. And when the car is moving, we can't precisely distinguish these two functions since they both cooperate with each other. Now, a further word of caution has to be added about right effort. When we say that right effort has to be made, this doesn't mean that we should just strive blindly. The mind is a very delicate instrument, and the development of the mind requires a very precise balancing of the different mental faculties. We need an alert, clear, keen degree of mindfulness to recognize what kind of mental state we're in. We also need a certain degree of wisdom to know how to keep the mind in balance, how to prevent it from veering towards extremes. This is an aspect of the middle way. It means striking the right balance in practice, knowing how to harmonize the different faculties to gain the maximum contribution from each without doing any harm to the mind, without exhausting the mind on the one hand, without letting it go into stagnation on the other. Especially in developing energy, we have to develop the energy in a middle way, in a balanced way. And to illustrate this point, there's a certain story that's come down in the text. The Buddha had a disciple whose name was Sona. Before he became a monk, Sona had previously been a musician. He had played the Veena, the Indian lute. After he took ordination as a monk, he was very eager to reach enlightenment. And so he went off into solitude and he began to practice with great enthusiasm, very strong burst of energy. He applied himself day and night, practicing meditation constantly until after some time his mind just became restless and tense and all of his vigor was exhausted. Then he became discouraged. He thought, no matter how hard I try, I can't get any place. Therefore, I better leave the Sangha and return to the worldly life. So he went to the Buddha. He told the Buddha that he'd done his best. He'd made a wholehearted effort to reach enlightenment. 
but he couldn't gain even the basic stages of mental concentration. Therefore, he said, now I'm going to leave the Sangha and return home. The Buddha approached this case very skillfully. The Buddha didn't just begin discussing his problem directly. Instead, the Buddha asked them, he said, what did you do before you became a monk? Soma said, before I became a monk, I used to be a musician. I played the lute. Then the Buddha said, tell me, when you were tuning up your lute, if you tune the strings very tightly, what would happen? Could you play well? No, then I couldn't play the lute very well. The pitch would be too high, and sometimes the strings would break. Then the Buddha asked, When you left the strings very loose, then could you play the lute? Sona said, No. When the strings were left loose, when the strings were left loose, then I would just get a dull droning sound. I couldn't get very good music coming from my instrument. Well then, the Buddha asked, how could you get good music from the lute? Sona answered, well, to get good music, I would tune the strings that they weren't too tight and weren't too loose. Then I could get perfect music out of the lute. The Buddha said, that's just the key to practicing the path. To be in balance, not too tight and not too loose. You shouldn't be too exertive, since that just exhausts your energy. It makes your mind tense and restless, and it leads to discouragement. On the other hand, you shouldn't be slack and negligent. If you become negligent, then you can't make any progress at all. The way to practice is according to the middle way. Balance energy with calm then you can make progress. Sona went back to his meditation cell. He practiced the way the Buddha taught him, and in time he reached his goal and became one of the foremost outstanding disciples of the Buddha. To develop the mind further, to make it capable of gaining concentration and insight, we have to enter the practice of the next factor of the path, right mindfulness. Samasati. Now, what is meant by right mindfulness? Right mindfulness is the clear awareness of what is happening in us and around us at the successive moments of experience. Mindfulness is a form of attention. To practice mindfulness involves attending to our experience. But mindfulness differs somewhat from ordinary attention. Ordinarily, attention, the faculty of attention, is used as an instrument for serving our purposes, our biological and psychological needs. Attention serves as an instrument of the rest of the mind so that we notice what the mind demands and desires, we notice the things that serve the mind's desires. We neglect the other things. We don't attend to them. But mindfulness is a kind of attention which operates independently of all ulterior aims and purposes. Mindfulness is an attention which observes our experience carefully and precisely always attending to what is occurring in the present without limiting the field of observation, without making any discriminations, without subordinating the acts of attention to, to external purposes. Mindfulness is attention concerned only with attending, with observing what is happening in the present simply for the sake of knowing and understanding what's happening, not for the sake of serving some utilitarian end. Mindfulness is attention that functions in an atmosphere of, a, of detachment. It's attention that aspires towards a pure objectivity, an awareness which reflects the nature of objects exactly as they are, without adding to them, without elaborating upon them, without interpreting them through the screens of subjective evaluation 
and commentary. The Buddha divides the practice of mindfulness according to its object into four groups called the four foundations of mindfulness. These are the mindful contemplation of the body, the mindful contemplation of feelings, the mindful contemplation of states of mind, and the mindful contemplation of mind objects. The practice of right mindfulness consists in the mindful contemplation of these four objects. In mindful contemplation of the body, the practitioner has to develop a continuous awareness of the bodily process, begin with the grossest object, the physical body. The mindfulness of the body includes a number of exercises. The most basic of these is the mindfulness of breathing, anapanasati. Sitting in a comfortable cross-legged posture, the meditator, when breathing in, becomes aware of breathing in. When breathing out, he becomes aware simply of breathing out. When taking a long breath, he's aware of the long breath. When taking a short breath, he becomes aware of a short breath. Thus the mindfulness just follows the in and out movement of the breath exactly as it occurs. This mindfulness can then become extended from the breathing to all the different aspects of bodily experience. The whole body itself becomes the object of mindfulness, attended to its mindfulness. The body becomes analyzed into its component parts, its organs, its tissues, and so on. So the body becomes laid out, as it were, on a slide, a mental slide available to our contemplation. Mindfulness of the body can further be applied to action, to the different postures of the body, walking, sitting, standing and lying, to the different activities, eating, moving about, going to the bathroom, lying down, speaking. Every aspect of physical experience of the body eventually comes into the range of mindful contemplation. The second foundation of mindfulness mindfulness of feeling. This involves attending to the feelings that arise on the different moments of experience. The pleasant feelings, the painful feelings, the neutral feelings. Whatever feeling arises is attended to with bare mindfulness, without liking and disliking. We simply become aware of whatever feeling has arisen. In this way, we prevent the mind from getting sucked into the feeling, from grasping after pleasure, from running away after pain. The mind becomes able to look at all the states of experience with calm equanimity and self-possession. The third foundation of mindfulness is the mind itself, that is, the general state of consciousness. To practice the contemplation of the mind, we have to see into the actual present state of mind clearly and precisely. We have to understand what kind of mental state is occurring. We have to clearly reflect the state without judging, without reproaching ourselves for the unwholesome state, without congratulating ourselves for the wholesome state. We just see the nature of the state of mind with detached observation. Then we have to determine the nature of that state, whether it's a wholesome state or an unwholesome one. Then we have to see into the kind of wholesome or unwholesome state of mind, whether it's a state that has attachment, aversion, or delusion, whether a state free from attachment, aversion, and delusion, and so on. Whatever state of a mind arises is noted just as it is, then allowed to go its own way without clinging to it. The third foundation of mindfulness is called Dhammanupasana, the contemplation of Dhammas. The Dhammas spoken of here are the factors and objects of the mind. At this level of mindfulness, we tune in on the specific contents of the mind rather than the general state of mind as we did in the previous exercise. Here the mind is dissected into its components, 
to see what factors are at work within it, whether the defilements are present or the wholesome factors. Then if the defilements are present, we have to note their presence, then investigate them to see how they arise, how they can be eliminated, how they can be prevented from occurring in the future. Then when the beneficial factors, the state leading to liberation arise, we become aware that they are present. Then we investigate how they arise and how they can be developed, how they can be perfected. Mindfulness of dhammas also has another aspect, that is the contemplation of the basic factors of experience not from the standpoint of ethical evaluation, but as a pure contemplative exercise aimed at insight, as seeing into the true characteristics of the body-mind process. But this we will deal with at greater length in the, in the following talk. Now, right effort and right mindfulness work together in close cooperation. Right mindfulness makes us aware what kind of state has arisen, whether a wholesome state or an unwholesome one. Then, through right effort, we apply our energy to eliminate the unwholesome states, the states that lead us into greater distraction and entanglement. And again, through right effort, we strive to arouse and strengthen the wholesome states that lead to calm and to clarity. Right effort and right mindfulness are both directed to the eighth factor of the path, right concentration, sama samadhi. Right concentration is defined as wholesome one-pointedness of mind. It is the wholesome unification of the mind, the mind collected and focused upon its object without disturbance or wavering. To develop right concentration, we generally begin with a single object, a very simple object, an attempt to fix the mind on that object so it remains there without wavering. We use right effort to keep the mind focused on the object and right mindfulness to be aware of the hindrances to concentration and the aids to concentration. Then we use our effort to eliminate the hindrances and to strengthen the aid, the beneficial factors. With repeated practice, the mind becomes gradually still unified and concentrated, brought to a single point. And when the mind gets concentrated, the hindrances are suppressed, and the mind becomes very tranquil. With further practice, we can develop certain deep states of absorption called the jhanas. These are four in number, ranked according to descending levels of calm and concentration. We'll deal with these in greater detail in the next talk. But this kind of concentration that's developed through this one-pointed practice, this is not yet the end of the practice of the path. When right concentration is made the eighth factor, this can lead to the misunderstanding that concentration is the final step of the path, the goal in the rest of the path. But that is a mistake. Rather, the state of concentration which is reached, where the mind is stilled and collected, serves as the means for developing insight. With the calm, collected mind, we have to go back to reach the first factor of the path, to reach right view. We set out to develop right view again, but this time we're not concerned with right view as a conceptual understanding of the Dharma. Now we're working to get a right vision of the Dharma, to get a vision of the truth. We set out to transform right view from idea into perception, into the direct seeing of the truth. And the way to go about this is as follows. Having gained a measure of concentration, we take the concentrated mind and apply it again to the practice of right mindfulness, the seventh factor. As a result of having developed concentration, the mind has become a powerful tool 
a real strong instrument of awareness, very clear and calm. So we apply this clear, calm, collected mind to the four foundations of mindfulness, contemplating the body, the feelings, the states of mind, and the mind objects. Then as the mind examines the flow of events in the body-mind process, as it tunes in on the flow from moment to moment, gradually there occurs step by step the arising of insight, which penetrates into the real mark of things. And as insight builds up, as it matures and deepens, it turns into panya, wisdom, the liberating wisdom which sees into the Four Noble Truths. At this peak of development, the seeing of the Four Noble Truths becomes direct and immediate, and it brings the destruction of the defilements, the purification of the mind, and the liberation of the mind from the fetters. But these higher aspects of concentration and insight, as I said, we will deal with in greater detail in the next talk. So we leave off here. Now, having explained the eight factors of the path, we should understand that these eight factors can be distributed into three basic groups. These three groups are moral discipline, concentration, and wisdom. In Pali, Sila, Samadhi, and Panya. The group of moral discipline includes right speech, right action, and right livelihood. All of these commonly share in the nature of being part of moral discipline. The group of concentration, the Samadhi Kanda, includes three factors, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. The last of these, right concentration, is the primar primary member of the group. The other two work together to bring about the state of deep concentration. Therefore, this last factor gives its name to the entire set. Then the last training group is wisdom, the Panya Kanda. This includes the two factors, right view and right intention. Right view represents the direct experiential aspect of wisdom. The inclusion of right intention shows another side to wisdom. It shows the purposive side of wisdom, that wisdom is not merely a matter of passive understanding, but an understanding that has the effect of altering our attitudes and goals that shows up in our purposes, intentions, and motivation. The three aspects of the path are to be developed with one stage acting as the base for the other. We begin with a kind of preliminary right view and right intention. These come at the very outset. They're really the forerunners of the threefold training rather than a part of it. To embark on the threefold way, we need a certain right understanding of the nature of existence and the right motivation, the right intention for taking up the practice. Then we enter the actual training with the factors of moral discipline. We strive to purify our discipline through right speech, right action, and right livelihood. Moral discipline acts as the basis for developing concentration. Then when the mind is calm and concentrated, that acts is the basis for developing wisdom. When wisdom is fully developed, it results in liberation, the release of the mind from all defilement. Now, there are two kinds of noble eightfold path. This is an important distinction which has to be remembered. First, there is the mundane path, the Lokiya Magga. This is the path that's developed on occasions when we make a deliberate effort to practice the eight path factors, when we try to purify our discipline, to develop concentration, and to arouse insight, either in limited day-to-day -day practice or else in intensive periods of practice as on retreats 
we make an all-out effort to develop mindfulness, concentration, and insight. And this is called the mundane path, Lokya Mugga. But the name has to be understood correctly. This mundane path is not a worldly path in the ordinary sense, a path leading to wealth, fame, or to worldly success. The mundane path leads to enlightenment. And in fact, we have to practice the mundane path in order to reach the super-mundane path. Without practicing the mundane Eightfold Noble Path, we cannot reach the super-mundane path. The mundane path is called mundane because even at its highest level in insight contemplation, it still involves the contemplation of conditioned objects, things included in the five aggregates. In this respect, it differs from the super-mundane path, which is the direct seeing of Nibbana, the unconditioned element. And also, it should not be understood that one is practicing the Noble Eightfold Path simply when one is trying to live by moral principles. People too often think that the Noble Eightfold Path is simply a path of ethical conduct and that as long as they're living within the basic framework of morality, that then they're practicing or living in accordance with the Noble Eightfold Path. That is not the case. The Noble Eightfold Path is the way leading to the cessation of dukkha. It's a path that includes eight factors, and it's really directly being developed and practiced only when all eight factors are working in cooperation to steer us towards the cessation of dukkha, towards the attainment of Nibbana. The occasions when we're really practicing and developing the Noble Eightfold Path will be times when our mental vision, our our outlook and understanding are guided by right views by an understanding of the basic unsatisfactoriness of our existence and the understanding that the real liberation is the attainment of nirvana. There will be occasions when our motivation is correct, when we're moved to reach deliverance from dukkha, to renounce the attachment to all the different conditioned things of the world. There will be times when our conduct is grounded upon moral discipline, upon the three training factors of moral discipline. And when we're making a right effort to purify the mind by cultivating the four foundations of mindfulness with a deeply concentrated mind, on those occasions we can say that we're developing the mundane Noble Eightfold Path. But the Noble Eightfold Path is something much deeper much more powerful than simple, than a simple ethical way of life. Now, when we practice the mundane path, as we reach the higher levels and enter the stage of mature insight, our understanding gets deeper and deeper, sharper and sharper. And when insight reaches its climax, when it reaches the highest peak, then at some unexpected moment, a sudden and radical change can take place. When wisdom stands at its highest point, if all the faculties of the mind are fully mature and the wish for enlightenment is strong and steady, then the mind turns away from all conditioned phenomena. At the same time that it turns away from all conditioned phenomena, the mind becomes focused on the unconditioned element. That is, the mind breaks through to the perception of Nibbana, the realization of Nibbana. It sees directly into the truth of the deathless element, the unconditioned. And when this happens, then all the eight factors of the path rise up simultaneously with great power of penetration focusing upon Nibbana. Therefore, at this time, the eight factors constitute the super-mundane Noble Eightfold Path, 
or the transcendental path. At this time, right view arises, not as right understanding, the right conceptual understanding, not even as the right view of insight, but as the actual seeing of the unconditioned. Right intentions arise as the full renunciation of craving, as the cutting off of the disposition to sense desire, to ill will, and to harmfulness. Right speech, right action, right livelihood arise as mental factors cutting off the disposition to wrong speech, right, wrong action, and wrong livelihood. Right effort arises as mental energy, which is empowering this very powerful state of consciousness that's focused on Nibbana. Right mindfulness arises as the faculty of attention or awareness fixed upon Nibbana as its object. And right concentration is the unification of mind, the mind focused upon Nibbana. So these eight factors have all arisen simultaneously, all performing their function, their function. And the mind equipped with these eight factors, this is the super mundane consciousness, the mind which has risen up out of the world and now knows the unconditioned reality transcendent to the world. And these super mundane states of the path, these come in four stages. There are four levels to the super mundane path. The first is called the path of stream entry. The second, the path of the once returner. The third, the path of the non returner and the fourth, the path of arhatship. We will deal with them in greater length next time. Now, the path experience lasts only for a moment, but when it occurs, that moment of consciousness cuts off and eradicates a certain set of defilements. It cuts them off right at the root so that they can never arise again. And the first time that the path arises, the path of stream entry, the yogi enters irreversibly upon the way to liberation. From the point he reaches stream entry on, he can never fall away. Up to this point, he could still fall back. He could still be swept back into the current of the world. He has no absolute assurance of winning the goal. But when he reaches the super mundane path of stream entry, in this one moment of realization, a complete change takes place in the very bottom of his consciousness. In this moment, he becomes a stream enterer, one who has fallen into the stream to liberation and can never return back again into the way of the world. Following the peak experience of stream entry, the yogi might still have more work to do, he still has three more attainments of the super mundane path lying ahead. Each of these other path moments will again eradicate certain sets of defilement and liberate the yogi from a corresponding degree of bondage to samsara. When the path, fourth path is attained and finished, then he becomes an arhant, one who has cut off all defilement and reached full liberation. Now, the yogi who has become a stream enterer, he might have as many as seven more lifetimes in which to move in samsara before he reaches arhatship. But he can never fall away. He can never be reborn in any of the lower worlds. And he is certain that he will reach liberation in no more than seven lifetimes.